Hi, it's March 26, 2014. Welcome to Cube Conversations. My name is Stu Miniman, and joining me for this segment is Jeff Kelly, and we're coming to you from the Wikibon World Headquarters in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Uh, Jeff, uh, some in the news have been calling this uh, you know, Cloud Week 2014. Uh, always a lot going on in the big data space, so uh, a lot, lot to cover. Let's 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 dig into it. So, first of all, uh, you know the Cube is today at the AWS Summit in San Francisco. Uh, a little bit of news out of Amazon, but the first one, uh, kind of the, the the big announcement this week is uh, Google uh, with, with their cloud. You know, made made, made a big announcement. Uh, the Google Compute Engine uh, ha has a lot of feature from functionality, you and I had a chance to kind of dig into some of it there. Um, you know, w w what was your take on Google's announcement this week? Well, from a big data perspective, um, you know, they announced a new service uh, around streaming uh, data analytics capabilities, allowing um, developers to build big data applications and take advantage of real-time data. So that was interesting. Uh, kind of look, look at that as an answer to a correlation to uh, Amazon's Kinesis announcement from earlier this year, uh, or I should say from uh, late last year. Um, you know, they, they lowered pricing, uh, Google did, so you they, know, they, they didn't just pressure. lower pricing, I mean, that, that, that was a big, big discussion point, Jeff. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they said slashing prices up to as much as 85% compared to the competition, yep. and not only that, but they really promised that the pricing of cloud will follow the hardware decrease, so really we should be able to follow Moore's Law, uh, which, uh, you know, is, is big if they actually stick to it. Absolutely. Uh, you know, there are questions about, uh, you know, TCO of cloud deployments, especially when you're talking about big data over, you know, a long period of time. Um, you know, whether it really is less expensive to do some of these big data projects, especially when you're talking about, you know, persistent, um, persisting large volumes of data in the cloud and doing that over time, whether that makes sense from a financial perspective versus bringing it on in-house, buying your own hardware and all that kind of Kind of good stuff. So um, it'll be interesting to see if uh, you know how that how this announcement kind of um, impacts those calculations, uh, and if it spurs some some enterprises to kind of rethink. Um, what the cloud is useful for vis-a-vis uh, -vis big data. Yeah, you know, my commentary on that, first of all, right, it puts direct pressure on, on Amazon. First of all, uh, we know if we have, you know, uh, short uh, usage instances, such as many big data uh, deployments are, uh, you know, Google will charge, you know, less than an hour, so that was something that they announced when they came out in public, as well as, uh, you know, if you're going to be using it for, you know, at least a month or longer, there are discounts that you get, which competes against the reserve instances that Amazon have. I've, I've seen some initial analysis on that that says that, you know, maybe if it's, you know, a month up to a year that Google is cheaper, but Amazon does have some pricing if you were to lock in for three years, uh, that could make it very, uh, you know, competitive there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think it depends on, you know, what your what the workload is and what, what you're trying to get, get accomplished. You know, in big data uh, projects, you know, we've seen the cloud, AWS specifically, be a great place to kind of do some of those uh, early experimentations where you've got maybe an idea for a big data application uh, and you basically build a proof of concept in, in Amazon. You don't have to pay for the hardware internally, um, you know, you swipe a credit card and off you go. Uh, the question from there is if it's a successful POC, do you then scale that out uh, in Amazon's cloud or do you bring that back in house? Um, but back to your point, so yeah, so it's certainly AWS has been a, a a place where we're seeing some of these experimentations happen. Um, and if Google can put price pressure on, on Amazon there, you know, that could have an impact. Um, but I think the area that they'll um, that they really have to focus on now, if they really want to get that kind of uh, business, is the tools around um, you know making it easier for developers to build these applications. Yeah. Uh, as we talked about on the cube uh, in past uh, uh, past segments about AWS as a really I would say a pretty uh, solid portfolio of big data tools, whether it's Kinesis for streaming data, Redshift, hugely popular, um, scale out uh, essentially data warehouse. Um, DynamoDB for, for NoSQL workloads. So they've got really a, a pretty comprehensive offering. Uh, whether Google can match that, um, they've got BigQuery. It uh, doesn't seem to me they have quite the quite the breadth uh, of, of yeah, applications. Yeah, that, I, uh, I mean, Jeff, I, I'd agree. There, there's no doubt that you know Amazon has a lead when it comes to how many features and how many uh, pieces they have. Uh, on, on the keynote this morning, Andy Jassy, you know, spent half an hour building all of the solutions that AWS had, and uh, you know, the punditry watching were like, you know, well, there wasn't much new here, and, and we've seen mm -hmm. most of it. But you know, if you compare and contrast it to what 
Google was doing, um, you know, it, it, it's clear that Amazon has a lead. Amazon has a lot more deployments. They have a many more customers. They've got tons of revenue uh, in there. Um, and, and the other place where Amazon really is leading Google is just, you know, global availability. They have a lot more data centers. They've built that out. And while, uh, you know, Google uh, has a network that, you know, pretty much, you know, second to none in the world, um, they do have work to do to build this out. I, I'd agree, you know, if you look at Google App Engine, has been around for a while now, that they do have a lot of pieces uh, to enable, uh, you know, big data deployment. I mean, m many could say that if it wasn't for Google, would we even have big data? I mean, Hadoop and everything well, came from MapReduce, so. Absolutely, I mean, Google's really one of the originators of what we call big data today. I yeah. mean, they have the original problem, um, indexing the web and, and storing all that data, and of course, they, they had to come up with a new way to do it and publish those papers in 2004 around MapReduce and some other things. Um, I think the underlying this whole conversation, though, is the, the question that others have asked as well is, is Google serious about this? Yeah. Um, is Google committed to uh, really offering a enterprise-grade cloud? Um, I'm still not convinced necessarily. Um, you know, we saw, and this, you know, optics matter in this market, and we saw during the uh, the Google event, you know, the engineers and even some of the more senior executives up there in t-shirts, essentially, and, and jeans, and you know, that's that's kind of the Google thing and the Silicon Valley thing, but if you're trying to appeal to, uh, you know, risk-averse CIOs in enterprises uh, in more traditional markets, that's not necessarily what they want to see. Yeah, um, so, 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 so Jeff, I mean, to that point, are they trying to reach the enterprise today, or is this the developer community? I mean, remember at, at reInvent, you know, Amazon gave out hoodies to everyone. It's now, true. They, true. they did have their executives on in a button-down shirt and, and a nice blazer. Um, Andy Jassy would make a great guest on theCUBE, I'm sure. Um, right. But th there is that, that, that dynamic, and it leads me to an interesting question. If we look at platform as a service, uh, for the first time we heard Amazon today actually talk about the fact that they really are creating a PaaS layer themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at the PaaS vendors out there, uh, most of them want to be independent of the infrastructure layers. So right. um, if uh, you take Pivotal, for example, has a partnership with uh, AWS, but you could also work that on Google Cloud, in private environments, and, and mm -hmm. I have lots of flexibility. Most of the PaaS providers uh, want to give you that flexibility, and many of them see Google as a good opponent to Amazon to help make sure that there's flexibility and openness, because if I develop only on Amazon, really, I'm, that, that application is going to be stuck there, as opposed to if I use a PaaS, uh, I'm going to have openness and flexibility. Mm -hmm. Well, so to your first point, do they need to attract developers? Absolutely. For any kind of cloud-based, uh, whether it's uh, infrastructure or more, or more specifically the platform, platform as a service, how do you gain traction with developers? And then hopefully that brings you into the enterprise uh, down the road. Um, so very good point, uh, worth, worth noting. I think, um, you know, ultimately, you're absolutely right. If you, you know, first of all, there's some some question about you know what exactly is platform as a service and how do you define that? And there's, there's a whole number of questions around that. But um, if we accept that platform as a service essentially is a layer above the infrastructure and below the application for building applications, essentially, um, absolutely you need it to, to be cloud agnostic because you you don't want to get locked into any one provider. You want to be able to move this between your private cloud, um, whether it's AWS, Google, uh, VMware, whatever the case might be. So certainly that's important. Um, I think Pivotal should, should get a lot of credit for what they've done uh, in terms of uh, partnering around Cloud Foundry, bringing in IBM and other potential competitors, at least competitors in their big data side of the business. Um, as they build that out, but still very nascent uh, market. Even there's still even no, as I said, consensus around definitions. You know, are the database tools that AWS offers on top of their infrastructure? Do we consider that platform as a service? Yeah. I would say yes, um, but there's involves more than that, and it gets into all the tools developers use to build applications. So. Yeah, and, and the other point on PaaS today, of course, is you know it, it could fit on many of the clouds, but mm -hmm. a lot of the deployments today are going in private environments. Right. Uh, in which case, you know, some of the points that we raised today are, are a little bit moot. Um, last piece I want to talk about cloud is Google. Actually, I'm sorry, Cisco uh, made an announcement, a billion dollar investment in what they're calling the intercloud. Uh, of course, Cisco uh, is, was one of the original four horsemen of the internet era. Um, you know, everybody needed to use Cisco. The enterprise uses uh, uh, Cisco and, you know, cloud in general is a real threat to Cisco. Uh, and it, to be honest, it, it's a little bit of a weird announcement because some people were saying that, you know, Google, I'm sorry, that Cisco is looking to compete with Amazon, um, but that's really not where Cisco's strength is. Cisco uh, right now has their partner conference going on. Uh, they have, you know, lots of relationships with service providers that buy their gear, uh, and Cisco will have, you know, a real 
investment to create services. And there will be some Cisco data centers, but a lot of the service providers will have uh, data centers also. So, uh, you know, even with a name like InterCloud, it's really more about the connectivity and portability. They talked a lot, Jeff, of actually about being able to port between various hypervisors, um, which is a little odd because when I think about most infrastructure as a service uh, providers, while there is virtualization in there, I don't usually have to think about that. Well, isn't that the point of, of some of these service providers that you don't, they abstract away that complexity. You don't worry about it. You worry about the higher level um, you know, building the applications and running and, and running your business essentially on top of it. Yeah, uh, um, I, I'm a little confused. I defer a little bit to you on this because you're kind of uh, the, our networking guy, and yeah. I, I don't quite understand Cisco's play here. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I think you know, I, I was reading a report from a financial analyst talking about Google, and if you look at the price war going on between Google and Amazon, it is the you know uh, the, the traditional enterprise guys that are under tremendous pressure. So mm -hmm. if I'm you know a NetApp or uh, in EMC or a Cisco where most of my hardware is going into the data center today and if that is going to have a significant shift to the large cloud providers, um, you know, I'm in trouble. If we go yeah. back to uh, the discussion we had about IBM, uh, IBM got out of the server business because they didn't see enough margins there and there wasn't mm -hmm. any growth and they've pushed that all off to soft layer so cloud is where the margin is and I think Cisco sees the writing on the wall and if they, they can't, they, they made an IBM move. Here's a billion dollars, we're going to really show you how we're serious here right. uh, and, and push forward. Although IBM I think committed two billion dollars but that's well, it's a billion here. And, and, and it was very clear when you said, I, I, all right, IBM had a billion dollars. Here's the data centers we're going to build. Here's the services we yeah. had. And here's our partner strategy. Um, you know, Cisco, you know, is still kind of finding their way in a lot of this. I think what they're trying to say in this announcement is, look, we, we see the future rather than being dominated by just a one or two um, mega cloud service providers such as Google and Amazon, we see this as, uh, we would rather see a, a plethora of smaller service providers, maybe specialized in different areas, um, and, if, and if that is in case, in fact the case, and as well as kind of private clouds and uh, other internal deployments, well, you're going to need to move data around, you're going to, networking is going to be a, a cr critical part of that. So that, that would make sense to me that they would want to uh, support that, that vision of the future. It's not clear to me at all that that's going to happen, but I can see why they would want they would they would they would be rooting for that type of uh, outcome. Okay, and, and that gives us a transition point, Jeff. There's been a lot of funding news lately. So in the last two yes. weeks, uh, Hadoop, uh, big news in the market, big announcements. Can you break it down for us? Sure. So uh, last week, uh, Cloudera held their first ever analyst event. In fact, it was the first ever kind of analyst day event from any of the Hadoop providers. Uh, so that tells you a little bit something about the maturity of the market. We're getting to that point where they feel like uh, it's important to invite us. Uh, analysts together to kind of tell us their story in a, in a, in a more cohesive way. So that was good. Um, it was a good event, uh, but one of the things that happened there, kind of making it a, a little bit more of a dramatic day than it otherwise might have been, was uh, they announced, Cloudera that is, announced new funding uh, right around lunchtime that day in front of uh, the, the team of analysts, the, the group of analysts there. $160 million in funding, uh, led by of all people, of all companies, T. Rowe Price, uh, Google Ventures also included, and uh, Michael Dell's uh, venture arm. Uh, as well. And then, of course, not to be outdone this week, just uh, yesterday, Hortonworks, a uh, competitor to Cloudera, depending on who you ask, uh, raised $100 million of their own. Uh, so I wrote, uh, or I should say, uh, remarked to some of our SiliconANGLE journalists uh, yesterday that this is clearly, to me, you know, the race is on for an IPO in this market. Uh, the two, both companies have stated publicly that's their goal is to go public. Um, so, you know, they're going to use this money, presumably, to, you know, shore up their uh, internal operations, kind of get their kind of get their ship in order, which you need to do before you can kind of go public. Um, what it does tell me, though, especially around uh, specific to Cloudera's announcement, I mean, that's a lot of money, $160 million. They're now about $300 million in uh, investment that they've taken. Um, pretty much prices them out about a $1.8 billion valuation right now. That pretty much prices them out of a, of a potential acquisition. So um, clearly, you know, IPO is the route they're going, but it tells me that large a, a round at this point in their life cycle that they're not quite as close as we as we had anticipated in terms of when they're going to go public. Um, it could be more than a year out. I think a lot of us were thinking it might even be this year or early next year. I think it's going to be a little bit further out than that um, because this tells me they need some of that funding to, to as I said, get that uh, get their uh, finances in order and some of the other internal things you've got to do. Yeah. Um, and then the, the other thing that I learned at that show or at that event, I should say, is. 
Uh, from a customer perspective, they've got about 300 paying customers, I said. I would expect that number to be bigger at this point. So for me, this is really all about using this funding to scale their operations, scale their customer base, drive some real revenue, cross a $100 million revenue yeah. annually, uh, annual mark. Yeah. Uh, how, how far are they off from that $100 million mark, which is usually okay, kind of one of the barriers? Yeah, for, I, for I think, so we estimated this year they were between 70 and $75 million mm -hmm. in revenue for 2013. Um, so I think it's doable that they'll get to that this point, get to that 100 million uh, number this by the end of this year. But the question is, and, and, and what got me thinking about this to some degree was the uh, the box IPO and the S1 talking about how much money they're burning through, um, you know, spending uh, lost I think 168 million dollars, and that's with 120 some odd million in revenue. Wow. So uh, you know I don't. I don't know the uh, necessarily the exact uh, amount of um, cash clutter is burning through, but I would suspect not only do they have to hit the 100 million mark, but get within a stone's throw of at least cash flow neutrality. Whether they're there yet, I don't know. I think it's going to take a while. Okay. I don't think they're there yet, I should say. Yes. It's going to take them a while to get there. So, so while we're talking funding, uh, another $100 million uh, you know, uh, uh, round raised uh, by a local company, Actifio. Uh, Actifio, Jeff, if you haven't run across them, uh, they, they're really uh, looking to, uh, it, they're, they're in the backup and storage world and changing the way that's done. So uh, similar companies, uh, people that are uh, pretty much familiar with data domain, uh, Actifio has a new way of doing kind of the copy management um, because one of the problems we've had in storage for a long time is you, you make copies for lots of different reasons and they end up all over the place and Actifio is a real simple way of, of making that uh, more streamlined, you, you, therefore use less storage. Um, um, and uh, it's been pretty popular. Uh, they, they built a nice new headquarters in uh, Waltham, Massachusetts, uh, down the road from us here, and a hundred million dollars. So uh, you know, good, good proof point that uh, there is still uh, you know a lot of excitement going on in the uh, in, in the storage world. Uh, you know, they, they are primarily a software-based uh, solution fitting into the whole software-defined data center uh, discussion there. Uh, and uh, you know, interesting one uh, to, to keep an eye on. Um, you know, I'm sure they're driving that towards uh, an, an IPO. Well, yeah, obviously uh, there's a lot of action happening in the uh, venture capital world. Um, you know, there's, 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 it's an exciting time to be in this market, to be, uh, to be analyzing this market. Um, you know, there's companies in both storage and big data and analytics that are really trying to kind of revolutionize the way, um, you know, companies manage data, make use of it, store it, and it's, uh, you know, it's really interesting. Clearly, there's a lot of money being, uh, being invested and big bets being made. Yeah, well, one last one I'll mention is uh, in the networking space, uh, a smaller company, Embrain, uh, was, uh, got a $14 million round here. Uh, Embrain is one of the companies that I heard a bunch of people talking about at the uh, Open Networking Summit that we covered a few weeks back. Uh, Application-centric networking. Um, so really, uh, you know, we talk about software and how that, that's leading the change. It's, uh, in, in many ways, it's, it's it's changing the management layer uh, of networking as well as enabling uh, you know various services to be able to be uh, offered uh, in, uh, in in a software fashion. Uh, Embrain uh, is a partner of Cisco's, um, so uh, you know while there's many companies out there that see SDN as, as really the disruptor to unseat uh, Cisco, uh, Cisco does have such strong power in the marketplace uh, that that it's still important that you're going to fit into that ecosystem. Yeah, that's well, that's an interesting point, uh, not specifically around networking, but just in general about all these new approaches to storage, networking, big data, are they disruptors in the sense that they're going to uh, really disrupt the uh, business model and the technology of existing incumbents, or are they going to be complementary? Um, you know, there was a question around that in, 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 at Cloudera's event, you know, they stressed numerous times that they are not trying to replace, for example, the traditional enterprise data warehouse. Um, and I agree with that, that they're not trying to replace that, they can't kind of do some of those workloads that data warehouses do, but clearly you're seeing uh, there's an overlap in terms of functionality, and clearly they're competing for the same dollars in some cases. So if not replacing, they certainly are competing, and I, I wanted to clarify that point because I've been quoted earlier in some of the media reports um, out there uh, about the fact that Cloudera was trying to compete, and I don't think that's quite what's happening. It, it's, more, it's much more subtle than that, um, but I wonder if something similar is happening in the, in the networking and storage space. Is it, are some of these disruptors trying to replace EMC and NetApp in the storage space or Cisco in the network space or are they Absolutely, trying to Absolutely, Jeff. So, right, right. If you talk about, you know, potential IPOs, it, it, it's it's widely expected that Arista Networks uh, will IPO this year. They are a classic direct competitor to Cisco. They, they looked at, you know, if you look, uh, Andy Bechtelstein, uh, you know, Help Fund Sun and Jay Shri Lal, who was a, a longtime Cisco executive, uh, found this company. They had a new way of creating uh, networking. Uh, they, they have uh, really an open format uh, for be able to program 
program and create their switches. So for, for high speed, especially low latency environments, uh, they fit well. They, they started in a niche uh, environment, especially in HPC environments, and have spread into the enterprise and have slowly been chipping away at, at Cisco kind of head on, as opposed to, uh, you know, some of these software type products, which, you know, might fit in with either kind of Cisco's ecosystem, which they're building with uh, the application-centric infrastructure, which is ACI. Others are rallying around what VMware's doing uh, since the NICERA acquisition uh, and trying to have much more of a software-driven, uh, let's commoditize the hardware piece and therefore, you know, pull dollars away. Because as, as you alluded to, Jeff, uh, for many of these spaces, um, you know, there's only a limited amount of dollars uh, that uh, companies can spend. So uh, if we can take, you know, you know, 50% out of what, uh, you know, the incumbent is charging, uh, there, there's more opportunity for a number of them to, to play in that. Uh, and, uh, it, of course, a big area that I cover is the converged infrastructure market. So if we can take the whole bucket of compute, networking, and storage, lump it all together, do it at a lower price point, improve the operational efficiencies, uh, there, there's a lot of opportunity there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, again, interesting market, interesting markets, I should say. Um, so we'll be uh, we'll be watching closely. Yeah. So so the so last things to wrap up, Jeff. Um, you know, we've always got a lot of events going on. If you check out SiliconAngle.tv, uh, you can actually watch right now. We're, we've got a big cloud tour 2014 going on. Uh, Amazon uh, Summit in uh, San Francisco is going on right now. Next show that I will be at personally will be the Red Hat Summit coming up in mid-April. And uh, Jeff, how about on the big data tour? Yeah, we're excited about uh, our next event, Sports Data SV. So we're going to be at uh, broadcasting live from AT&T Park, which is the home of the San Francisco Giants. Uh, it's going to be a great backdrop. Uh, actually, I, I believe this will be our second or maybe even third event there at AT&T Park. Uh, but this one's going to be spoke, uh, focused on uh, using data to essentially uh, the use of data in professional sports. We're going to have guests from the Giants. Uh, from the uh, San Jose Sharks and some of the other uh, local professional sports teams uh, talking about how they're using data to improve their business, to improve the team on the field or on the ice, as it were. Yeah, moneyball type stuff. Moneyball type stuff. And we're going to question some of those moneyball uh, assumptions uh, and, and, you know, how much of uh, moneyball is, is real and how much of it was, uh, you know, a literary license, if you will. So it'll be interesting to uh, see how uh, real-world uh, sports franchises are really using data. Uh, to uh, run their business and uh, become more competitive. All right. Well, Jeff, it's always good to catch up on with you on everything that's going on in the space. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching this episode of uh, Cube Conversations. Uh, we'll be back for uh, more plenty soon. And don't forget to you know watch SiliconAngle.tv uh, for the live events, Wikibon.org for the research, and you can hit us up on uh, Twitter. It's uh, Jeffrey F. Kelly, and I'm at Stu.